Welcome to the Heart of Sirs podcast. I'm your hostess, Melanie Joy Pensack, here to share heartfelt conversations with folks recovering from Sirs and with those special people serving the Sirs community. The podcast was created to help bring awareness to the physical, emotional, and mental experiences of folks navigating Sirs day to day. The world needs to know what SIRS folks go through for deeper empathy and understanding. Through stories and vulnerability, we can help the world understand the winding journey of SIRS recovery. Thank you for being here to open your mind and to open your heart. I am very much looking forward to today's conversation with Dr. Jackie Meinhardt. Dr. Jackie Meinhart takes an evidence-based approach to functional medicine using cutting-edge advances in science, technology, and personalized precision medicine to help patients heal, thrive, and optimize their human potential. She is an innovator, clinician, and scientist using functional and integrative medicine to treat and find the root cause of autoimmune issues, psychiatric disorders, thyroid and hormone imbalances, digestive and gut infections, and many inflammatory-based conditions. Dr. Jackie Meinhardt has worked with and trained by Dr. Andrew Heyman and is certified by Dr. Richie Shoemaker in diagnosing and treating chronic inflammatory response syndrome. She has completed additional training by Dr. Dale Bredesen on chronic inflammatory effects on brain function and neurodegenerative disorders. She works closely with Ruth Chris and P in the diagnosis and treatment of embedded infections. Dr. Meinhardt earned her doctorate of nursing practice from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where her research focused on biotoxin exposure and cognitive impairment. She also has master's degrees in nursing, a family nurse practitioner from Georgetown University, and integrative medicine from George Washington University. Jackie is a diplomat with the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness and is a board-certified family nurse practitioner. Dr. Meinhardt also holds a faculty appointment at Georgetown University, where she currently teaches biostatistics. While not working, Dr. Jackie Meinhardt enjoys spending time outdoors with her friends and family and is one of the head coaches of the Riverside High School crew team in Leesburg, Virginia. Thank you so much for being here, Jackie. We're really looking forward to diving into some questions with you. Oh, Melanie, I'm so happy that you invited me to be here today. I always enjoy connecting with people who have experienced with this illness, because it's my experience, there's not a whole lot of resources for them. And this illness hit my family personally. My daughter was a sick kid and no one believed me when she was young. And my mom was a sick person. She had some illnesses and the amount of distrust that my mother experienced in the medical community and then myself with my daughter. And all you're trying to do is get people to feel better, right? Especially your own family members. It makes you want to help others the way people maybe didn't help me during those times. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really appreciate hearing a little bit more about that and your daughter and your mother. It brings me to wanting to know a little bit more about how you ended up in your profession. I'm curious if you were interested in medicine or biology as a a child and what made you choose this path? Yeah, great question. And honestly, my grandpa Schaefer, my dad's dad, was a medical doctor. He was actually president of the Maryland Medical Association for many years. And he was a physician and surgeon back when that's how they trained you, right? To be a physician and a surgeon during the World War II timeframe, Vietnam. And he had always said to me, he was very old at the time, but he said, you need to become a nurse practitioner. Don't become a doctor. (laughs) And I remember saying, what is a nurse practitioner? I was so young. I didn't know. And years later, when I was going to college, I decided to become a nurse. It's what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to help people. And back then, don't forget, I'm 50, right? So this is, we're talking 30 years ago, these conversations were happening. There weren't too many nurse practitioners back then. And I said, I don't even know what this means. But I ended up going to a a college in Pennsylvania, Villanova. Loved every minute of it. I didn't want to leave. I'd go back to college tomorrow if you let me. I had so much fun. (laughs) And then 
I went on to go into nursing, right? I started at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. It was baptism by fire. I did emergency medicine. And if I knew what I know now, right back then, I imagine like how much we could have helped people. But I was at Hopkins when Dr. Shoemaker was in Pocomoke, Maryland, discovering the fish kills during the 1990s. And I remember I'd see this guy on the news and be like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing because I got to live this experience because we had the patients, right? In the emergency department at Hopkins, but I never met him. I never knew who he was outside of the news channel. And while I lived and worked in inner city Baltimore, we experienced a lot of different emotions, right? The community didn't trust the medical system. I don't even know if people understand that. Inner city hospitals, there's a lot of community issues, if you will, sometimes. And I learned so much. I learned more in those years working at the hospital than I did ever in school. Things school don't even teach you about community and about cultures and about how people integrate into the system is just as important as helping the system. Is if you can't integrate into the system, you can only help so much, right? So being able to have that understanding and to communicate the way people understand. So I have to not only think about what I'm saying to the patient, but are they even understanding what I'm saying? Do I need to explain it more simply, a different way, more number, like you have to figure out how that person listens for them to truly hear what you're saying. It was great. So I was at Johns Hopkins for many years. And then I left and I started working for a big pharmaceutical company. And that was the business of healthcare. It was the most wonderful education that I ever received about the business behind medicine that you don't really learn. Doctors and nurses and PAs, we don't really learn that, right? Until you're in practice, I suppose. But I learned a lot there as well and loved it and then became a mom. I stopped working and I was a stay-at-home mom for a number of years. And then I decided I wasn't ready not to work anymore, right? I needed to get back into the system. So I became a nurse practitioner at Georgetown. And that was the best decision I ever made. And then the second best decision was to get my doctorate and continue that servant leadership, right? Giving back to the community that, that taught me. I'm now teaching them what I know. And I'm teaching them about CIRS, although we don't talk about mold specifically, right? Because again, they have resistance to that word. The, the medical establishment has resistance to that word. So I use different words. I use immune activation, different types of immune deficiency. And they understand that. They totally get those words. And that's how I got my doctorate. And Dr. Shoemaker stood by me the entire time when I was at Georgetown. And now they're redoing my study which is really a wonderful compliment. So I'm very lucky. My career has been something I never could have imagined, but I'm so grateful for. Wow. I love how you've had a lot of different perspectives that have brought you to where you are today. And I'm sure all of those varied experiences are so helpful now for working with SERS patients one-on-one. Absolutely. And I enjoy it. I love working with these patients. That brings me to my next question relating to the relationship of mental health and SIRS. And so if somebody comes to your office and they already have a diagnosis of maybe ADHD or depression or anxiety or OCD, how do you begin to explain the relationship of SIRS to their diagnosis in a way that they can digest to help them understand more about what could be the underlying cause of that condition? That's a great question. And so I get a lot of people that come to me that don't even know what CIRS is. So I get plenty of patients who come to me for CIRS, but I'm also working with the psychiatrists now at Amen Clinic because we know as our medical community that so much of mental health is rooted in environmental exposures, whether it be bacteria, virus, parasites, whether it be mold, whether it be actinomycetes, we understand that there's lots of things that can impact. I don't even call it mental health. I call it brain health, right? We need to stop talking about mental health. It's brain health and looking at the brain as an individual organ made up of blood vessels. And that's where my specific research is. It's actually changing the way we communicate about the brain. We have to look at it as a living, breathing organ with blood vessels. And that's my experience is I get like the sickest of the sick, right? The people who like CIRS 
providers send their patients to me. We can't figure this out. And this is usually when I start getting into the circulatory system, the blood vessels, the inflammatory processes that happen with long COVID, with CIRS, with different types of viral or bacterial vectors, right? And we have to start looking at how these vectors and these exposures, why is this person not getting better? We know that this protocol works. We know that other treatments work. Why isn't it working for this person? What's different about them? And it's really kind of, I like to say, you open the hood, right? You got to start looking underneath all the stones, if you will, to see what's going on. So when they come to me, when patients, when psychiatrists, when other providers refer their patients to me for CIRS or ADHD or different types of schizophrenia, bipolar, different types of anxiety or depression, I don't automatically assume it's CIRS, number one. Like, so I do my due diligence because not everything is related to CIRS. A lot is, (laughs) but not everything is. And that's the key. It's being able to say, okay, we're ruling out everything. And I'm listening for certain cues, whether it be about circulatory issues, whether it be about CIRS, mold, actinomycetes. Because again, don't forget, actinomycetes is everywhere. It's outside, I always remind people. So why do you respond versus someone else? That's where the questions become. But it's making sure the patient understands that these exposures can be what's driving your ADHD your schizophrenia, your bipolar, your mania, right? Or even think of it like women with perimenopause, people who are going through hormonal issues, but they don't recognize that their symptoms get worse during certain times of the month. They don't track that pattern. And those are the things that my brain has been very used to pick up. It's those pattern recognition to say, okay, this is where we're going when we're starting to look deeper into these issues. Do you find that people feel relieved or happy that they have some sort of additional information about their brain health if SIRS is a part of that picture? I'll look at their blood work and I go really deep into the blood work because I want them to understand. Because if you don't understand why I'm doing something, you likely won't do it if you run up against a roadblock. So I'll often talk to patients and say, when I see this level, This is what I hear from patients. Jackie, you know, I don't feel bad. I just don't know what it's like to feel good. I don't ever feel good. I always feel run down, tired, body aches. My head is always hurting. My muscles always hurt. I can't exercise. I'll hear so many different things. And I'll say, this is what I hear when I see this lab value. And they're like, oh my God, that's totally me. And they make that connection. Oh my gosh, there could be a reason for this. All the doctors told me I'm fine. But when you look at the blood work, you see this because that's my pattern, right? That's what I see. Or for example, with women with hormonal changes, because more, it's my experience, either more women have CIRS or more women make the complaints and go to the doctor versus the men. I'm not sure which one it is. It could be both, but it's my experience. More women have CIRS and my research demonstrates that as well. More women, about three fourths of the patients are women well, when this happens, do you get this symptom? And they're like, you know, I never really thought about it that way, but you're right. Every time this happens, this time of the month happens, I get this symptom or it gets worse or it gets better. And it's like, yeah, it's because of the estrogen and the progesterone and the testosterone, right? We have to start looking deeper into what all these biomarkers are, right? The, the proteomics, we have to start looking deeper into them and understand them from what I call a systems biology standpoint. You can't look at one body system as its lone self. Now, if I was a surgeon, yes, you can do that, right? Because you're going in there for an anatomical reason. But when you're looking at it as a complex group of systems, you have to understand that the adrenal glands don't just work as the adrenal glands. They affect every other part of the body. And you have to understand that, not look at the person as a bunch of silos. You have to look at them as one person and not just different body parts if that makes sense. It's so interesting that you're touching on this because I do talk to a lot of women who will notice that their SERS symptoms do seem to flare up in a cyclical way. And we know that the hormones are a huge part of the SERS presentation, the disruption of hormones. And 
I do encourage women to really start to track their symptoms because I see that sometimes women feel like they might have had another exposure when in reality it could be related to their menstrual cycle if they're still menstruating. And so that's a really, I think, interesting point to a flag for people that if you are menstruating to start to track your symptoms, you know, around your cycle and see if there are patterns month to month. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Some of the hormonal changes. I know a lot of women have heavier or irregular menses once they get a SERS diagnosis or an exposure, their libido can really change. Can we talk a little bit more about some of that? Yeah. So what we'll see classic now there's perimenopause, which is that every woman will experience it at some point of their life, which is the fluctuation of estrogen progesterone, specifically impacting testosterone as they age, as estrogen and progesterone lower, but they can peak and trough, right? They go up and down as you're going through perimenopause. When we start talking about increased estrogen, right? There is a process in the body that happens with any inflammatory, chronic inflammatory event. And that's something called aromatase, which is where testosterone is pushed into estrogen. It's a natural process. And actually, testosterone being pushed into estrogen, aromatase is a defense mechanism that the body does to protect the brain because estrogen is protective, right? It protects brain structure. It also protects different parts of the body. Estrogen's a wonderful hormone. <laughs> As anyone who's gone through perimenopause or menopause knows, estrogen's a really good thing that you want to have. And as you lose it, you may not start, to, everyone may not feel well as they start to lose it. But when testosterone is being pushed to estrogen, example in these CIRS cases, it's a protective mechanism. And that's also a way I think we need to communicate differently is that your body is protecting you right? Your body's brilliant. It's trying to protect you. You may not feel well while it's doing it, but it knows the estrogen's good for your brain to keep your brain working. Now, when we see that testosterone being pushed to estrogen, people are exhausted. People have mood swings, right? Because of the low testosterone, high estrogen, they'll have brain fog. We'll see these things that these symptoms that arise. But again, as that's happening, there's ways to treat that, right? There's ways that we can stop the aromatase with their supplementation, medication, lots of food, right? But that's going to be a slower process. But there's different things that we can do to help there. But the key is that people start to make that notice, right? They start to notice. Now, my exam of patients, especially if they come to see me in the office versus just on Zoom, like my exam starts the minute I walk into that room because I'm looking at them for signs of estrogen dominance. And you can't really do that on Zoom. You can see their face and their shoulders, right? But a good thorough exam is always important, I think, when it comes to CIRS as well, if you can do one. Because there's signs of estrogen dominance that I can see in a person versus just on Zoom. That's like kind of the old way of doing medicine, if you will, right? Back in the 80s and 90s, as you did physical exams, right? Now everyone's relying on different lab values, which isn't bad, but there's a role for physical exams in this illness as well, in my personal opinion. Are you finding at all, or is there any information about folks that experience SIRS and then recover or go through the process of the issue maker protocol? Does it impact fertility in any way? Do we know any information about that? No actual direct study has been done on that question. However, what has been done is we know that fertility is changing just globally, right? Just globally, it's changing. And now that may be because women don't want to have kids. That also may be because women may not be able to get pregnant as easily as they did in the past. We know that something called insulin resistance, which is very common in CIRS patients, but insulin resistance is common in lots of other things too. It's not always just about chronic inflammatory response, but truly chronic inflammation. We'll start to see higher levels of insulin. That's basically what insulin resistant is, is when you need more insulin to do basic work of the body, right? And insulin, I like to remind people, it's not a hormone you want. You don't want lots of insulin. You want as little as possible. So when you look at the reference range, if it's two to 25, I'm looking at six or less. That's my good goal for insulin is really low, 
right? If you're already at 25, you're already insulin resistant. My theory is if you're at 20, if you're at 15, you're probably already resistant to a certain extent. And we're seeing that because of high levels of stress, because of high levels of inactivity, or maybe I shouldn't say inactivity, but just different activity. People aren't moving the same way they used to 10, 15, 20 years ago. And then also the food system, right? Our food system, there's a lot, we could probably do five teleconferences on that topic alone, but there's certainly all three of these are impacting it. And then just the toxins in our world, the endocrine disruptors, which increase insulin resistance as themselves, right? I've had a few women on the podcast and one talked about getting pregnant and she was still able to get pregnant after going through the protocol. But having SIRS doesn't necessarily mean you can't have children. No, not at all. It may be a little bit more challenging, but not at all. But again, I think the one thing I am amazed with is that a lot of women don't know how to track their cycle. A lot of women don't understand what that means, whether you be a mom, a daughter, a dad who's trying to help their daughter figure out how to track their cycle or a brother who's helping their family member. But the day one of your cycle is the day you get your period. So the day you start menstruation is day one. And then you count from there. So our viewers can't, aren't seeing this, but I actually still have a calendar underneath. My, I still track everything, you know, how I feel, my cycles, different types of symptoms. I encourage people do that. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on a piece of paper, but it's really important to track it somehow. And now there's apps for it. All those wonderful period cycling apps. I use those for CIRS patients. I use it for patients who are trying to get pregnant, people who are trying not to get pregnant, (laughs) right? So you can use them for lots of different reasons. And then for weight loss, we use those period trackers for weight loss too, how to maximize exercise and nutrition during the cycle. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I use my Google Calendar and just yeah. mark on there to keep track of things. Or if there's an unusual symptom that pops up, I just pop it on there so that there is a reference point or place to go back to if I need that information. Yeah, that's good. That's a good idea. Anyway, however people want to do it, <laughs> as long as they keep track of it. <laughs> yeah, that's such great information then to take to your provider, you know, to add a little bit more information that's- to your healing journey too. Yeah. It offers more depth because I don't have to ask the patient to do it. And it then takes another three months for them to get that information. I always say you want as much information as you can before you come to see me or any medical provider, right? So that when you get there, you can be like, here, it's all here in a silver platter for you, (laughs) right? That's how I counsel my sister and my kids. You always want to be doing these things so that when you do go and someone asks you, you can say, oh, well, I've been tracking that here. That is also another great tip. And I'm glad to hear that you like to actually receive all of that extra information ahead of time or at the appointment. I know during my recovery, I was doing that, particularly in the earlier parts where I would go in and I'd want to get as much information as I possibly could from my provider. Time was limited and those appointments go quickly. So I would actually send my provider like the highlight reel, like these were the positive things. These were the challenges. This is what I noticed prior to my appointment, like a day before. In Brilliant. The, yeah. I know that they were able to review it. I don't know if every provider can do that the day before, but if not right at the beginning of the appointment, it really does help you to get a little bit more out of your time. Well, not only that, but I also think from a provider standpoint, I believe you. I say to patients all the time, and I think patients actually appreciate this because they'll look at me and be like, you're not going to believe me. And I'm like, oh no, I believe you. I promise. I believe what you're going to tell me is your truth, whatever it is you're experiencing, because I bet you diamonds to donuts, you've been to a provider who said you can't possibly have all, and they look at me and they're like, oh my gosh, you're so right. Like my last five providers told me that I couldn't be this sick. And I was like, oh, I believe you. Again, we need to stop siloing patients, like putting like their symptom in one area. There's no boxes, right? We need to look at the entire patient because people are getting sicker. More and more people are getting sick and not feeling well. And I'm not saying it's all CIRS. It's not all mold or actino, but people don't feel good. A lot of people are having these mental health symptoms, these brain health symptoms, right? And there could be reasons behind it, but if you don't look, you won't know. And that's the key is, and I tell people, I'm so proud of you for coming in and letting me look, letting me have these conversations with you because it's a vulnerable spot, right? It's a vulnerable spot as a patient. 
Let's go into brain health a little more now. I've had a few listeners curious about concussion and wanting to know, does concussion make you more susceptible to a SERS diagnosis? Can concussion cause a SERS diagnosis? Can we unpack some of that? Yeah, great question from your listeners. So chronic inflammatory response happens because of a genetic sequence, right? So people have these specific genes. In 15, 6, 17 years of doing CIRS treatment, I've only ever met two people who didn't have the gene. Everyone else had a genetic haplotype, that HLA related to chronic inflammatory response. Now, HLAs can be passed from family member to family member. Genetics is you have a one in 25% chance of passing your genetics onto the people that you create. So it's not everyone who has CIRS will have kids that have CRS. There's again, there's a, there's this one in 25% chance you pass it along. Now, people who have the gene does not mean the gene is turned on. So there's genetics and then there's genomics. Genomics is the gene is turned on and it's active, right? So there has to be some sort of a trigger. And that's something that a lot of patients say to me, I want to figure out what my trigger was. And we usually do figure it out. But there are some times where we don't, and that really is bothersome to patients. So we do work hard at trying to figure out what that initial trigger was. But the triggers are typically bacterial or viral. They're typically maybe surgical, but a patient went into surgery. Ever since I had that surgery, I've never felt the same, right? They'll say to me, or something's always been different ever since that. I always had this symptom, and then they just started feeling worse. We're seeing that a lot with COVID, right? People who get COVID and they just feel it's that long COVID phenomenon, which I believe there is a segment of that that is related to chronic inflammation for sure. But it's usually bacterial, viral, parasitic, different types of physical or traumatic experiences. And I do say perceived or actual, right? So when we start talking about trauma responses to people, you can have a trauma response that you maybe didn't experience physically, but mentally it was something that you experienced. And people say, but that never happened. And you said, no, but it, it did. And I believe PTSD. Like I have witnessed the progression of PTSD from the mid early nineties, all the way up to 2024 now. And as a medical provider and a hundred percent, there is trauma that can cause a emotional trigger that ignites the immune system, a hundred percent. And then there's blows to the head. It could be a knock. It could be a full TBI from a car accident or an, a fall or an injury of some sort. We do see that because of that mismatch of glutamate in the brain. Again, we're always talking about a protective mechanism, right? The body wants to protect you from rising glutamate in the brain. So it does certain things to do that, right? to protect, to decrease glutamate, but it's that issue, that injury that creates that increased need of glucose that draws the glutamate into the brain. But we need to stop that. So it's rest. It's turning the lights off. It's turning the screens off. It's doing whatever you can to protect the brain. And then even sometimes in the hospitalized setting, this is what we used to do at Hopkins is HBOT oxygen. We used to have the big rooms. I used to get HBOT treatments, right? But we were in the big rooms, right? Where we'd roll the beds in, right? And everyone would experience HBOT. They believe it or not, they have those OR streets, if you will, typically used for like wounds, but we'd use them for PTSD back then too. And then we think of different types of cool therapy, right? Cold therapy helps with PTSD and different types of brain trauma. Again, because you're rewiring that parasympathetic nervous system over time, right? Versus the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic drive. So it's much more complicated than just the way I'm talking about it. But the key is the patient has to understand that they are experiencing something that is actually happening in their brain. I believe we need to help you feel better. And that may be rest. That may be a variety of other treatments, depending on whatever it is that's going on. I feel like my next question could be a whole episode itself. So feel free to speak to it in a way that is concise and would maybe just add a little bit to the information that people already have. I know that there are common patterns that we see from the neuroquant folks who yeah. go through SIRS, they're getting their neuroquant, their brain scans done. And 
the area that I see people really suffering in is wanting to understand like, where do their symptoms come from? And, (laughs) you know, there's so much mental energy, emotional energy that goes into like, where does this symptom come from? And we don't always get to deep dive with our physicians on our neuroquants because there's so many other pieces that we're assessing apart in an appointment that makes sense. Is there anything that you can share in general around, like, if you see this on a neuroquant, you might have these types of symptoms. Is there Great anything question. that we can give people to help them understand that a little bit more? So that's the neuroquant, but also the visual contrast test. And I say, you can't get a neuroquant every month. You can't do it, right? You can't get a spec scan every month, but you can do the visual contrast test every month. Let's start with the VCS and then I'll jump to the neuroquant, kind of the easier to the more challenging to understand. But the VCS, if you look at the VCS and if you actually, the Air Force created this test back in the 1970s, the Air Force calls it the functional acuity contrast test, the FACTS, F-A-C-T. That's where all the data is. It's not under VCS. When you Google it to look for data, it's under what the Air Force calls it. And if you look at what the Air Force, and they still use this test to this day on pilots, right? If you're flying, if you fail it, you don't fly. If you pass it, you do to this day, because I have a lot of special ops in the Air Force who still take this test for work, right? But what we'll see is one in two on the visual contrast test, left and right eye, that's your eyeball. If you look at eight and nine, that's the back of your brain, the cerebellum. And then if you look in between the three to six, roughly, that's going to be your limbic system. So you're going to see if you have lots of wherever your red marks are, right, or your incorrect answers, the X's are versus the green checks, that specifically correlates to a body part. And that's the patients find that. So in, cause I, I'll say to them, I'll look at it and I'll say, oh, I see that you're having some issues with word finding, name finding and different symptoms. And they're like, how did you know that? And I'm like, oh, look at your VCS test. I'm looking that you're having difficulty with fluidity of movement. I'm looking that you're having instability of emotions and they're just amazed at the concept that you can see it. But then I say, but well, let's also check it again next month and three months from now and six months from now, and let's compare it to where you were because the visual contrast test is one of the cheapest, most reliable tests we have in medicine. I wish more people would do them, right? Because it can give you a lot of good information. So then the Noroquan. The neuroquant is a volumetric expression of the brain. It's looking at the size, the shape, and the weight of the different areas of the brain compared to aged matched controls. Meaning if they were testing me, they would take my brain if I had symptoms and compare it to a 50-year-old woman who had no symptoms, a 45 to 50-year-old woman who, who had no symptoms, that age block, right? Versus all patients, but it would look at that. So that's the baseline of what a neuroquan is. And then we start looking at the thalamus, the caudate, the putamen, the cerebellum, the prefrontal, the cortical gray, right? And all of those areas have a specific function. For example, prefrontal is executive function, right? Where a lot of decisions are made, where you hear on the temporals, but then you make the decisions in the front, if you will. Right. So we can actually talk about symptoms because also different neurologic symptoms originate in those areas of the body. For example, if we talk about Parkinson's or we talk about ALS, they typically experience in a certain area of the brain versus another. Now, one of the things that I found really fascinating when I was doing my doctoral research at Georgetown with Dr. Shoemaker. And the doctors at, at Georgetown, who were also my advisors, right, they, they loved this study. They're like, oh my gosh, this is such a fantastic study because it was actually all statistically significant and they never saw that before. So it's actually really cool. Um, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back there. But because they were learning about CIRS, but not understanding it was about mold or actinomycetes, they were understanding about the physical components of these 250 patients that I had did a retrospective study on looking at their neuroquants. And they were saying, oh my gosh, this is such an amazing test. Yes, it is. It's an amazing test. Cortec, the company who created it is so brilliant. Hopefully in the next couple of years, maybe in the next 10 years, it will be diagnostic, but that's the key. You have to understand the neuroquant is not a diagnostic tool. 
So the neurologist or the radiologist can say whatever they want in the report, but as a medical provider, I can't make a diagnosis of the neuroquant yet, right? It still isn't there yet. However, I can make assumptions when I start looking at the size and the shape. And that's why I'm very open with the patients. Now, the key with the neuroquant is too, is I don't know what your brain looked like when you were healthy. So yeah. that is a limitation of the neuroquant. However, what I do is I'll do a neuroquant in the beginning of treatment and then at the end of treatment when they're feeling 75 to 90% better, we'll repeat that neuroquant to look for changes in the swelling or the hypertrophy or the decrease in size or the atrophy of the brain in those different areas. And that usually correlates to symptom resolution. So those are two really good tests. One's really expensive and one's really cheap. <laughs> yeah, I love all of that information. I don't think a lot of people know those details about the VCS. And it's great to know that you do get more in detail with the neuroquant and the VCS with folks. But if you think the second cranial nerve, it runs from the eyeball all the way back to the cerebellum. So think of all those area of the brain that it innervates. And again, once you start looking at the Air Force data, you're like, oh my God, this is such an amazing test. Why aren't more people using it? Yeah, it's pretty good. Can you share a story maybe about a patient who's had a positive outcome uh, in regards to their brain health when they have gone through surge treatment? Absolutely. Thankfully, I have many because patients do get discharged and I say they're off living their best life. And then they come see me once a year, right? Just to keep in, just God forbid, right? They don't want to let go. And I get that. I always give them every year, I give them a prescription for cholesterol well call just to have in their back pocket in case they need it. Because they also feel comfortable knowing that they have the treatment if they need it, God forbid. But I have a young patient, I have elderly patients, and I have people in between who, for example, one patient came in to see me who was young. The young patients typically are very resilient, meaning they bounce. I don't want to say they bounce back, but they get better a little bit quicker than the older patients. The thing with the younger patients that's really devastating, if you think about it, and I only know this because it was my daughter, is they don't know what it's like to feel good, right? As an adult, I know what it's like to feel really good. And then I know what it's like to feel really bad. And I know I want to feel really good again. But there are some kids who've never felt really good. And if you think about it, that's just devastating to me that they don't know what it's like to actually want to get up and run around with their buddies, right? Or be like a kid, like a traditional kid. What I grew up as, as a kid, right? Now, I know kids are different than I was <laughs> 50 years ago, but just because life's different. But this one kid, we got him on, he was doing a mixture of cholestyramine and well call pediatric doses because- it was just easier some days to give him powder versus a pill, but we would give him the appropriate dose. And he did really well with that. He was negative for Marcon's, which I think was really a, a really wonderful thing that he was negative for that. But I always say Marcon's is not a one and done, meaning you get it, you get rid of it and you're done. It's something that can always come back. But this one boy, he did not have multiple antibiotic coag negative staph. He did not have it. And then we fixed his gut and then everything else quickly resolved after we figured out it was the not mold, but actinomycetes in his environment. And then he brought things to school, like his parents homeschooled him for a while. And then he went back to school and he now, he now knows he's in college now. So I've been following him now for years and he's doing great. The college was a little bit of a tough transition as it is for many kids and universities are pretty much gross. They have a lot of mold and mildew in some of these dorms. So we had to do a little bit of working there, but he ended up playing sports, no head injuries. Thank goodness. He played tennis versus football or lacrosse or another sport that you may get an injury with a head injury. So he did really well. And I see him probably once a year now. So for about 12 years now, I've been following him. He's doing great. There's another woman who did have Marcon's. So we got her out of a, the getting out of the environment is always the most challenging part. And I am a big believer of mold avoidance. Who isn't, right? Like, who isn't a believer of mold avoidance? That's my one, my comment, right? Like, who isn't? However, not everyone can move. Not everyone can leave their job and just go live somewhere where there's no, like the desert, go live in a tent in the desert. Like, I'm all for that if that's what you can do. But a lot of people can't, right? They've got financial obligations or family and 
whatever. So this one woman, we got her into a good environment, but she was working in a poor environment. So her home was good. Her work isn't good. So we got her to work from home. And that was a lot of letter writing, right? There was a lot of work there and underneath that. She had more cons and it was a bear to treat. And then she got rid of it and then she got it again. But the interesting thing was, is she knew she got rid of Marcon's because she would say to me, and this is what I explained to my patients now, she would say to me, the clouds have parted. And she was like, it's not 100%, but I can see through the fog. There are days where it's crystal clear and days where it may not be as clear, but she knows. So she knows when she has brain fog, she does a test now. She tests for Marcon. So that's her tell. I call it a tell, right? That's her tell where she needs to like kind of come back and say, hey, Jackie, can I get another nasal swab kit? Yes, absolutely. I have them all on, <laughs> on special order, right? Get as many as you want. And then we got her, we did her gut, we did everything else. And now she's probably once every six months I see her because of her office is still a challenge with all the issues with coming back to work post-COVID. But it's more of that kind of accommodations thing. And then the ectino for her is difficult because even though her office where she works, we got her office clean and her home clean, but what about the hallways? What about the cafeteria? What about all those other places that now we're working on that because she's getting exposed there as well. But she has to live in this area, right? Because of parents, she can't leave, but that's, she's doing really well, right? She's doing really well. We're managing those symptoms. And then I have a guy whose biggest symptom, believe it or not, he had prostatitis. That was his biggest symptom is he had frequent urination that he thought was prostatitis. And he did have an infection. So he did have something there, but mostly it was related to the environmental exposures. That was his big one. And he was here in the DC area. He was a government worker. So he drove people in here in the Washington DC area, they live like maybe an hour and a half outside of DC because it's so expensive to live in DC. So the travel, the commuting is a lot. They commute a lot. And if you have to go to the bathroom, that's really tough, right? If you're commuting, <laughs> that's tough for anyone, not just someone with CIRS, but that was his big symptom. So now he's still going into the city, but he'll be retiring soon and he's not going to the bathroom nearly as much and feels a whole lot better. So there's many examples. But that's the question I get the most probably is about Marcon's. Is it really a big deal? Because there's lots of different medical providers who say it's a big deal. And there's lots who say it's not a big deal. I happen to be on the side. Anytime you see a bacteria that's creating symptoms, I say that is a big deal. We need to treat that. Do I hold up treatment? Do I just do Marcon's? No, I do everything else while I'm treating Marcon's at the same time. But I do believe that we need to get rid of that bacteria. And there's actually a great doctor in ENT in this area. I don't know if you know him, Melanie, out in Winchester. Mm-hmm. All he does, he's actually an Air Force doc. I forget if he was a colonel, but he was an Air Force doc, understands CIRS, understands the visual contrast test, and all he does is Marcon's. Wow. And he'll just scrape it out. He, I, it's called a balloon plasty when he just goes in there and he cleans out and people feel amazing afterwards. Wow. Yeah. He's brilliant and he's a nice guy. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing all of those success stories. I think people will really appreciate hearing that. And then also just some of the details about how people can feel once they get over certain parts of the treatment or how certain parts of the treatment affect them. That's fantastic. Keeps people inspired and hopeful. And thank you so much for sharing so much information so far. I would love to close it out with just a couple questions that I like to ask all my participants, if you're okay with that. Of course. Uh, What inspires you to continue to be a part of the SERS community and do this work with SERS? I find it an honor to work with patients, to be invited into their life, to be able to help them. And I'm flattered by that, that they want to get better. And I'm glad that I'm a part of that process their team, if you will, the medical team. As I said, my mom had a really negative experience with healthcare. It actually wasn't CIRS. She didn't have CIRS, but it was just a negative experience. And I remember looking back and saying, I never want someone to be treated the way my mom was. And so I'll often say to people, if you were my mom, if you were my sister, if you were my dad, if you were my child, this is what I would say right? Because I think that anytime you're invited into someone's life, it's personal, right? It's personal for that person. And again, like I want to do what's right for that person. 
to help them feel better or to find answers, or maybe I'm not the person to help them. I'm very honest. I think you would do better with this person, right? Because of whatever the situation is, right? Whatever the symptoms are, you know, maybe it's not. I I actually had two people who did not have CIRS based off the genie test. It was not CIRS. And I was like, we need to find what the answer is, right? So there's those things too, but I do it because I want people to find answers and to feel better. That's my job as a nurse practitioner, right? That's what I do. I help answer those questions for patients. And the last question would be, what are your deepest wishes for the SERS community? Oh gosh. So like a wish, like it may not happen type of wish. Like <laughs> be DD in the bottle. Yes. Yeah. What would be like in your bottle, dream like, wish? <laughs> like, I wish there was like a one and done, right? To get people to understand. And I think COVID's helping that. I think the one thing about COVID is that it's projected research. It's like literally catapulted research into ways that I'm so grateful that people are finally talking about these things. If there's one thing, right, research has quadrupled, right, which is wonderful. I wish more people understood how devastating mold and actinomycetes are to some patients. Shouldn't be hard pressed to understand, right? When you think about different illnesses and how something can affect someone more deeply than another, but I wish just more people understood. I wish there was more public education about it. Thank you. Well, what you're doing is certainly helping to spread the word. And thank you so much for bringing a lot of integrity to the SERS community and being a voice for so many and for spending some time to educate all of us today. Really appreciate your work. Thank you so much, Jackie. Well, I'm so happy to be here with you. Please tell everybody how they can stay in touch with you or get in contact if they'd like to hear a bit more. Yeah. So you can go to www.amenclinic.com. That's where I work Doctor with Dr. Daniel Amen. I work in the Reston, Virginia office, just right outside of Washington, DC. And then you can call our office at 703-880-4000. And we're happy to get you scheduled and happy to answer questions. I do answer questions from patients. They'll email the older potential patients, but I'll answer some questions as long as they're not specific related. And then online, I have an Instagram and TikTok. I haven't done anything recently. You need to help me, Melanie. I'm not very good at that stuff. (laughs) Happy to do that. Yes. Spread the word and and get things out there. (laughs) It's great to hear your voice. And thank you so much again for talking with us today. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you for listening and for your kind attention. To keep in touch, follow the Heart of SIRS podcast on Instagram. You can visit melaniepensack.com forward slash the heart of SIRS to donate. Your generosity helps to keep this podcast growing. May the awareness of SIRS spread far and wide, helping to change millions of lives for the better.